Um, and given all the time that I've spent both chit-chatting and getting the, the computer set up, I'm going to not read the three pages of bio that was that was printed for me, uh, but I would rather you talk than me talk, but I will introduce Alex Holloway, who is over here, he'll be coming in front in a minute, who is a research area specialist affiliated with the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. Um, go ahead, just the wrong screen scene here. I get this Whoops. We can change that real quick. Well, we're changing that. Um, and the Michigan Surgical Quality Collaborative. He studied human biology and supply chain management at Michigan State University and has worked on patient care and quality improvement at Michigan Medicine since 2017. And he's joined with Dr. Michael Engelby, who is a professor of surgery here in the section of patient surgery with an undergrad degree from Yale, medical degree from Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and residency at the University of Michigan and a postdoc at the University of Washington Medical Center. I'm vamping if you time to fix it. Thank you. Specializes in kidney and liver communication, has lovely taste in red shirts. Um, <laughs> done, good, perfect. I think we should stop the share and then restart it. Okay. Now we're gonna try this one more time. My Scorpio, he likes to ride Thanks on the weekend. Um, there we go. Is that working? Yeah, perfect. Is everybody happy? It's working on that? Okay. It is. So we, we can raise tables up and down. We just can't do technology. <laughs> anyway, than, yeah. in all seriousness, um, uh, Alex and Mike have been working with us at CHEPS for, for a while on a number of projects. They've been doing amazing work long before that in our health system. Um, I've had the pleasure of hearing Mike talk a number of times, and I'm very much looking forward to today. Um, delighted to have Alex here along with the team of students that he's been able to spend some time with. And so for those of you on Zoom, we'll be watching the chat if you want to add questions. And otherwise, we're going to do our best with the technology and welcome Alex and Mike. Thank you. Just, can you just remind me, I just make sure we get the format right. Like how long, how long are we talking and what is... I would, when the eyes like, glaze over. Like, I would like to try, and depending on whether we interrupt with a lot of questions versus waiting until the end with all the questions, we'd like to walk out of the room between 5.30 and 5.45 so that the students can do their reflection work together. Oh, yeah. That won't be a problem. So if you talk long, we just won't do a lot of questions. I talk a lot. But... That's okay. <laughs> I've heard you. I'd rather hear you talk than us ask questions. Uh, so, no, no. <laughs> other way around. So let's see. I'm in a camera here. Yeah. I guess it doesn't matter, right? Because I'm not blocking the screen on Zoom. Um, I think it's an honor to be here. One of us looks like a professional, and uh, I don't. But um, I, uh, my name is Mike Anglesby. I'm one of the surgeons, and we're going to talk about kind of. I can't say I've really ever thought about engineering solutions, but I've learned a lot from Alex, and appreciate that um, a lot of the work that we've done, the foundation has been kind of core tenets of engineering. Alex? Yes. Oh, that's us. <laughs> Middle-aged middle man with a lot of jobs and young person who's smarter than I am. I have these disclosures, mostly just extramural funding type stuff. I'm presenting today kind of from a lens of a, of a surgeon. So um, I, uh, I'm a transplant surgeon. So what does that mean? So we take organs out of people and we put them in. Um, and about six years ago, I was um, on donor call. So a donor call is when you kind of go take them out. That's the least kind of fun part of our job because you got to get in like helicopters and planes and stuff. And uh, I, we had a busy weekend. We had three, I did three procurements in a row. And one of the places they had initiated um, this new kind of policy either at the hospital or like the state where we would stand there and the patient would be on the table um, and they would read the little family statement regarding the gift and to pay, you know, to really celebrate the donor and the family just to set some, you know, kind of some tone around the gratitude of this event of procuring the organs. You know, as a middle-aged transplant surgeon, you're usually just kind of going and going and going and Part of the job is not to let the Teflon be kind of cracked by the emotions, right? Because that's not, um, at times, that's not the best thing for kind of the task at hand. But the story was of this 19-year-old woman 
high school soccer player, knee injury, bunch of surgery, bunch of opioids, addicted opioids, overdose, death. And that's why I was just donating. The same weekend, there was a wisdom tooth extraction, high schooler, stuck on opioids, overdose, and death. And an undergraduate experimented with opioids and alcohol really for the first time, overdose and death. So I had this weekend where my Teflon was cracked. And I'm like, what is going on with this? And you know, one of the things, the, the beauties of working at being a teacher is because there's a medical student with me for, for at least two of those three events. And um, they just asked, kept asking questions, not about like the hepatic artery or the timing or like the helicopter ride or whatever it was, but like about the context as to why these people were donating organs. And it really forced me to like think about it a lot. I guess I'll leave it at that. And um, what we were, what was I, what I was experiencing was really the beginning of what is now well known as the opioid epidemic. And, um, and it, it started to take up space in my mind and really fueled a lot of this work. And this is kind of, you know, there's problems that happen in kind of in the alleys and the streets that are absolutely critical. But, you know, if you can bring a problem into something that you're, uh, you're causing, it can be pretty impactful. So thinking about the opioid epidemic it became clear that at least two of those three people, but probably all of them, initiated their essentially addiction through prescription opioids and um you know you come in and you know you're a healthy looking person i take out your whatever and i give you a bottle of pills most people don't hardly take any um some people take the whole bottle and struggle to ever stop taking them and then they get refills and they take more and more and it became clear that we as physicians are really over prescribing for pain surgery dental care were really like core parts of that. And it became clear that those opioids were either were leading people to chronic opioid use or landing in the community. So we have a talk, um, whatever the high school is, community high school, it's like you know, a mile from here. And asked a bunch of like 16 year olds, how many of you can get your hands on opioids just like five years ago? And like half of them raised their hand. Hopefully that number would be different now. I'll ask you guys, has anyone ever, has anyone been ever given opioids for like wisdom tooth extraction or any kind of surgery? And has anyone ever texted you and asked you if you had leftover opioids? So one, yeah, usually it's about 20% of the room. I think things have changed a bit because the stigma and the reality around opioids has changed a lot in the last, you know, five or six years. But nonetheless, it's a problem. Now the opioid epidemic and addiction and the context is very complicated. This is a relatively small part of it. But if you're a doctor, like, you know, if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you, you find out that you're, you pick some, you know, beautiful young person's knee and then they got stuck on opioids, that can really change you. So, so we kind of did some stuff. We started a group and, um, and this group is uh, called Open. So Chad Brummett, one of my colleagues, an anesthesiologist, general allergies, plastic surgeon, three of us kind of started this work and it's a combination of research um, practice change and um, kind of advocacy, um, kind of mini missions. Nonetheless, we started caring a lot about this problem. And we, um, I think there's animation here, right? Alex, you made this slide, right? Yeah. I don't remember what happens. Yeah. So <laughs> it became clear to, um, I don't know what the cap in the, what is that part, Alex? What does that mean? No one's uh, we don't give patients education. I fix your whatever. What should I operate on? Gall Can I take out your gallbladder? Uh -huh. Can I take out your gallbladder? Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. My gallbladder. Right. I'll take out your gallbladder. I'll give you a bottle of pills. You probably won't take them. They'll be in your cupboard, or small percent will take a lot of them, and then they'll. And it turns out, if you take forty opioids over the five days. On day six, you feel like S-H-I-T because you're like, wow, why do I feel so bad? What's going to happen? Doctor gives you a refill, takes more opioids. Oh, I feel better again. So it's this, um, it's this kind of dangerous kind of thing that we got into, and there's lots of drama as to why that happened. But the bottom line is a physician, you write a script, and that goes to a patient, and that's something we kind of can control. 
So step one of a problem is not just to tell a story like I just told you. And that story is on purpose, and I'll, I'll explain to you why this is relevant to engineering, but then also to do science around it. So we wrote a lot of papers, and um, this first one is uh, kind of tells the whole story. And 6% of patients about 90 days after surgery who come in opioid naive. So since you're not letting me take out your gallbladder, I took out your gallbladder, a thousand of you and across the country and, and you're opioid naive. So you weren't kind of, didn't have chronic pain or anything like that. Took out your gallbladder, we kind of um, had a you know, good surgical outcome and all that. About 6% of you, so that's 60 humans, 90 days after surgery are still taking opioids. And that is a huge problem um, for lots of reasons that are uh, not really relevant here. But and you can kind of see, we looked at, um, I think that is orthopedic surgery, it's 8% 8 per, 8 hand surgery, spine surgery, 13%, freaking adolescent surgery, which is crazy town, 5% cancer surgery. We write for twice as many opioids when we do the same operation for cancer patients, 10%. Breast cancer. So breast cancer, there's a lot of um, uh, work around best care and breast cancer care and breast cancer survival has really transformed the last 20 years. But so many patients come in with bad breast cancer, they get radiation systemic therapy, surgery, and they're left on long-term opioids. So there is an opportunity here. Walking around taking opioids every day is not kind of the best uh, scenario. So we did some research. Alex, did you do this? Ryan. So, um, so one of the, actually at the time, I think he was a medical student, he's now um, surgical resident. And he basically looked at cholecystectomy, lap coli, taking out the gallbladder, like I'm gonna do to you. Um, and this is just from the University of Michigan. And we looked at our prescribing habits. So this is percent of prescriptions, this number of pills range from zero to 120 pills. We kind of see most people in here and they're on the 45 pill range. And then we asked all the patients, how many pills did you take? And you see this kind of big difference where most patients weren't taking hardly any pills. There's a couple that essentially take all the pills you give them, kind of no matter what. But most people aren't taking any. So you see this kind of mismatch. And what we did, and I only have two more slides, I'm going to Alex talk. What we did is we had this pretty simple system with one procedure one act of writing a prescription. And if you ever see Michigan, I kind of describe us as like, we're kind of in some ways like the Soviet Union and we're kind of in the military and we have a, um, we have a military leader, I won't say his name, but he's like, we now write for 15 pills, you know, in a meeting like this and practice. Oh, I'm sorry, but if this was Soviet military, 15 pills, you said, 16 of them would be stolen. 16. <laughs> <laughs> I should not have. I, I tried to get, let you take, me out, take out your gallbladder. But, um, so anyway, um, simple system. So these, pres these prescriptions are mostly written by surgical interns. And all in a room together is like, by the way, now we write for 15. And you can kind of see the number of pills that we wrote for changed from this is in kind of how much morphine's in the pills, but I'll take my report. This is about 40 pills and this is 15. No variation, practice changed essentially immediately. And we quickly changed uh, that practice. And this was kind of study one of about a hundred studies around practice change. But, you know, that line there of that immediate change in practice is not scalable. It's not reality. It's a simple system and gets to my point around we engineering solutions to complicated problems. And this is kind of how I think about it as a mental model that I'm gonna let Alex talk. So I'm a clinician. I can tell your engineers, that's what you are. I can tell you a story that everyone paid attention to about donors, right? And that's that, young people donors. Like, did anyone not like my story? Like it was an effective story, yes? Good. All right, great. So that's what you can use your clinician partners for, because we are seeing human beings, and that's, so you need a story. Good, did I show you some data indicating that there's an opportunity and a problem? Yeah, see, of course we all need data, right? 
Does data change anyone's behavior? Not very well, right? So you need a story because emotions matter. You need data because we are scientists. So you can't just make stuff up. But what you need is a pathway for change. You need to design a system such that the change is as easy as possible. I'm going to tell one more story, then I'll stop talking. So I have three children. My oldest is applying to college right now. When she was finishing eighth grade. In order to graduate, she had to give a talk to her eighth grade class. This was a big deal in our family, and I'll spare you the details. But it was a really big deal. <laughs> Many tears. She decided she wanted to talk about plastics in the waterways in Michigan. And I'm going to use a prop here. How about this? So um, she's like, Dad, you give talks. You're a you know, professor. Can you help me? And she spoke to me, which was a big deal to me. I'm like, my, at the time, 14-year-old daughter speaking to me. I am all in. I will, no matter what's going on, I'm going to, sure, let me help. I appreciate the brilliance of my, at the time, 14-year-old daughter, because she's like taught me a lot of stuff. And we put together this talk. She gives it, you know, my wife and I are crying. She's actually speaking. She graduated from eighth grade. It was a big family moment. We'll leave it at that. And I learned a lot about plastics in the waterways in Michigan. Fast forward a couple of days. In fact, the first thing happened actually right by here at that Starbucks on Plymouth Road. A couple of days after, I'm driving and I, uh, I'm going to do, do this here. And I go to the Starbucks and I'm like, I'm an opposite of the North Campus like complex. And I go in there and I like, get my coffee and I just get like coffee with cream and sugar. They put the coffee in there. And I'm like, oh, no lid. I'm like, I'm off plastics, right? No lid. Because I, you know, so I had a paper cup and I put my cream and my sugar and I kind of poured a third of it out so I wouldn't spill one in my car, walked into my office, no lid. And I do that again a second time. But then the third time I was at the Einstein's in the hospital, I was about to make rounds with like the liver team. And I like go there and I, I act there, I put my own coffee and put my cream and sugar and I'm looking at this plastic lid. I'm like, like I can't really walk through like the clinical care areas without a lid on my coffee. So I put a lid on there. And since that day, I have put a lid on my coffee pretty much every other time. What's the moral of my story? I had, I had an emotional tie to no plastics, right? Like, that was my freaking 14-year-old daughter. I was all in around behavior change. I had emotions. I knew the data. Like, I listened to this to my daughter teach me, and it's scary as heck, right? Or if you look at the plastics, these pictures of, like, Lake Erie and all the stuff. Oh. So I had a story, I had data. What I didn't have is no one had engineered me a pathway for change. No one had made kind of the change easier or feasible. So when I think about like how do people who engineer, engineering minded people like Alex in the clinical kind of scenario and the clinical kind of you know, bottom line is trying to change practice. That's how I think about it. There's a story, there's data, but then it's engineering whatever the change is paying homage to the story and the data, but making it the kind of as easy as possible so that I could go get my coffee and not have to put a plastic lid on. Until Starbucks changes the way they deliver coffee, I can't change my behavior. Until the way we change the way we, we have, a, we deliver kind of whatever the workflow is or the care, then none of the clinicians, none of the nurses can realize any change. That's how I think about what's the role of the engineer. So Alex is gonna tell some stories, I think, so some data on, Kind of how we used some of that um, process oriented, I don't know, industrial engineering kind of mentality to try some change, broke up prescribing across the state of Michigan. And then we'll answer some questions. Does that sound good? All right, Alex, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, using the scary uh, bar surgeon to uh, reduce opioid prescribing only goes so far. Um, we, we had to take a systems-based approach to uh, really get this through our health system. And then, of course, we had dreams to take it to the rest of the state as well. Um, and so we devised what we call the Michigan Pain Optimization Pathway. And this is a uh, fairly simple pathway. At the time, it was pretty novel. Uh, just even talking to patients about opioids in the preoperative period was uh, a little difficult to figure out. But that's, that was kind of the first part of this pathway was in the preoperative system. We talk about uh, educating the patient 
letting them know that surgery is painful. Believe it or not, that's not always discussed with the patient. Um, and so talking to them about that and what to expect after surgery uh, was the first part of our pathway. And then during surgery, uh, we, we kind of left that alone uh, for obvious reasons. It's a, anesthesia is a pretty complex thing. So we uh, created a list of recommendations that, that kind of happened at, at U of M and, and that's as much as we did in the, the intraoperative space. But postoperatively, we, we took the data and stories that, that Dr. Inglesby just shared and, and kind of synthesized these evidence-based prescribing guidelines and included some opioid alternatives like Tylenol and Motrin. And we pretty much standardized them as, as kind of this is a standard set of uh, pain management that you will do for this specific procedure. And until then, that was not very common. People just prescribed what they were traditionally taught to prescribe. And it was, it was kind of just a general, here's, here's your pills. Um, so we really started putting numbers to these things. And then we had to figure out where to start. Uh, and of course, starting small, uh, that's small. <laughs> so we you have to, um, we, we thought about where, where would be a good place to do this. You want to do it in a small environment where there's relatively few nurses and, and things. And we're lucky at Michigan Medicine to have a center called the East Ann Arbor Surgery Center where outpatient surgeries happen. It's, it's a pretty clockwork routine organization. It's, it's where we send those kind of low risk patients to have their quick procedure and, and go on their way. And so we uh, took that clinic and we met with one surgeon and, and uh, told him our narrative, our story and got him on board. Uh, and then we uh, went and, and briefed everybody at the surgery center and, and got them on board with, with this. Um, and one really humbling thing about this, this analysis we did is, is we found that about 14 different people talked to patients about pain care. So, when, you know, you, you think, okay, we're going to go to the people who prescribe opioids. They talk to the patients about pain. We'll tell them to, you know, to tell this story to the patient that they're going to manage their pain with Tylenol and Motrin, and then only opioids if their pain is really bad. Uh, and, and we quickly found out that that one person was just, you know, one voice among 14 and, and you know, going to the door, the patient could hear from a nurse that they should take all their opioids and stay ahead of the pain and, and all the work we did to counsel them and, and get them prepared is kind of out the window. Um, so it's really important that the whole system understood how we were changing pain care. And, and we really took the time to go to uh, all the nurse groups we could, all the surgeons, anesthesiologists, and we planned a lot, a lot. So before we launched, we, we went over this multiple times. Uh, we identified our first patient. Uh, and she was a very nice lady, was super willing to be a part of our uh, pathway and we educated her. She showed up for the day of surgery. She was super ready. Um, they were actually going to prescribe her 10 pills and she corrected them. Uh, the people at the site and said, no, I, I get four. I'm part of this special pathway. And they said, oh, you're that patient. So it's, it's like wonderful. I mean, that never happens. This patient knew exactly what was going to happen. It was a sterling story of success until she came out of the operating room. Yeah, does anybody know what Ponzi is? Postoperative nausea and vomiting. <laughs> So this patient came out vomiting profusely and it had nothing to do with our pathway. Up until then, all she'd done is received education. Um, but all the providers and nurses and, and people around her, you know, see somebody coming out vomiting, know they're on this special pathway and that is the association they make. And so there's a lesson here that you, you can plan for uh, as much as you think will happen, uh, but something can always go wrong. And, you have to be prepared for that, that reality uh, and, and do diligence and care to follow up on that. So we, we met with the anesthesia team and with the nurses that were there and, and made sure that, you know, we went through what happened with the day and made sure they understood that the pathway was not involved and, and kind of avoided uh, what could have been uh, kind of a bad smirch on, on, our, uh, on our project. So that was certainly exciting. That patient ended up doing very well. They uh, didn't consume any opioids after surgery, and we graduated 14 more patients from that pathway pilot uh, with sterling success. So uh, things went very well, and we decided to expand to new procedures. Um, and most of these are general surgery procedures, but we worked with our colleagues in neurology to do prostatectomy uh, and one with uh, sinus surgery and our rhinologist. And we also expanded to new sites. So the, the Michigan Medicine Network also included satellite operating centers at, in Chelsea, Brighton, and Northville. Um, so we had to go and meet with nursing teams again and, and start to tweak this process. So I, I will 
reiterate that that pathway document we have is extremely important because we can take that as kind of a template for care and then identify places at these new sites where those activities might be different and then we could adjust accordingly. Um, and as, when we did that expansion, we also did uh, a really important thing, and that was uh, creating the infrastructure to measure both our processes and our outcomes. So when you uh, implement a pathway in, in care, you can tell people how to do things, and, and this is what is supposed to happen here, uh, but you don't really know if it happens unless you measure it. And so we use our electronic medical record system to create uh, all kinds of reports to understand you know, who had surgery, how many pills did they get? Who was their surgeon? Where did they receive that operation? Uh, how long did they stay? Did they call to the ED with complaints or the emergency department with complaints of pain? And all these things we need to measure to make sure the system is working as intended. But even more so in healthcare, we work with humans and uh, understanding how those processes work for them and, and how uh, their surgical experience turned out is extremely important. And so we had kind of an army of uh, undergraduate students that Dr. Engels be so generously alone to me to call these patients and ask them, how was surgery? How many pills did you take? Were you in pain? Um, and so this is kind of my, my second lesson to share is uh, this was all quality data. It was all to measure how our processes were working and, and make sure that this pathway worked out. But it had merit as a uh, kind of publishable data that we could share with the academic community. Um, and so I, I always uh, tell people to look for those publishable opportunities um, because we, we were just doing this to evaluate the pathway. It turns out it, it worked and we could share uh, with our friends at other medical time. Uh, so this is a study we did. I believe this is the paper we asked you guys to read in advance. Um, basically, we, we took those calls. How many pills did you consume? And we, we kind of aggregated them and measured. And over half of our patients reported taking zero pills, which I mean, even a year before that would, would be unheard of. It was somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent of patients go opioid free. So this is to show that just education, a little Tylenol and Motrin went a long way, but 99% uh, of our patients were taking fewer than 10 pills, uh, which was uh, well below all our recommendations. And it really confirmed that at least on the prescribing side, we were getting it right. Patients were consuming fewer pills than we were still prescribing, even though they were pretty low prescriptions. Um, but more importantly, in, in healthcare, it's, it's important to, to measure kind of the result of that. How does that convert to the patient experience? And so we uh, took a look at our median pain rating from patients, and they reported a one, which is minimal pain. Uh, that's on a scale of no pain to severe pain. And then we asked, uh, was it effectively managed with this pathway? And, and a great majority said it was. Uh, but then we asked about their satisfaction with surgery on, on the whole to get those kind of uh, more diffuse effects. And it was, a, it was extremely satisfied, a median rating of 10. Um, so we have effectively reduced opioid prescribing without compromising patients' pain or uh, satisfaction after surgery. So we kind of got to this point. We said, okay, we've done really well at, at Michigan Medicine and these, these general surgery procedures. How do we continue to expand our impact? And we did that in two ways. One was to uh, expand to procedures. We kind of appreciated there's a spillover effect with this. So uh, you're a, a surgeon, you've never really heard this narrative or this data, you haven't seen these data, you're just prescribing along, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you do uh, appendectomies, right, and, and the, these people, me, come to them and, and share uh, kind of the good news, right, and they start doing this in their appendectomies. Well, they also do other procedures, and when they get familiar with this care, we found that they started prescribing more Tylenol and Motrin to patients and other procedures that didn't have protocols and it kind of was bleeding into care uh, in general and so we kind of switched our strategy and said we need to include as many specialties and uh, as wide of a variety of procedures as is feasible and um, so we started working with um, the pediatric surgeons and appendectomy and vascular surgeons and, and all kinds of different specialties uh, to, to get as wide of a spread as we could. And furthermore, we uh, started working with uh, some existing infrastructure in the state to uh, reach more hospitals. So we kind of took this out of Michigan Medicine and, and opened it up to the rest of the state. Uh, and so the way we did that, and instead of going, you know, one hospital, one hospital, uh, sharing this powerful narrative, and unfortunately, Dr. Angus time is a little too precious to do that. So we uh, utilized these uh, existing 
platform. So we're really lucky in Michigan to have uh, these organizations called CQIs. It stands for Collaborative Quality Initiatives. Uh, and by no coincidence, Dr. Anglesby directs them. Uh, but they are groups that are data registries uh, who uh, bring members from all hospitals in Michigan together to share data and best practices. And so this was a, a really potent environment we found to share our data and best practices. And then uh, representatives from all these member hospitals would take that learning back to their uh, systems and, and translate that and, and start to change care in their own systems. And so this was kind of the, the process we developed with this group. We would collect data about opioid prescribing. We would use that data to generate prescribing recommendations for this wide variety of procedures. We develop a pathway of best practices and a very digestible summary document that people can read and figure out how to work in their system. We would then share them through these CQIs and they would be disseminated to the individual practices by the number of hospitals. And then we would collect another round of data and see how that worked. And we just kept iterating that process measuring the data, feeding it back to these hospitals and uh, inspiring them to continue changing. And so uh, one of the studies that we were able to do uh, with that data was take a, a matched cohort. Uh, so we had our opioid sparing patients at Michigan Medicine, and we wanted to see how they compared to a standard of care. And in healthcare, kind of the gold standard is like a randomized controlled trial where you you take one patient and, and do kind of an intervention, then you have your placebo group that gets nothing or you know, the standard of care. A uh, little harder to do in surgery and very onerous. So we have this kind of backdoor, which is called a uh, propensity match scoring system. Um, and that's basically taking your group of patients and defining all these variables, um, you know, their comorbidities, their age and all that, uh, and then matching them to a much larger set, finding people who have very similar attributes and creating kind of a uh, facsimile population that you can compare to yours. So this is to show we have very similar patients. This is our opioid sparing group. This was our standard of care on the right. And we looked at the uh, number of opioids prescribed to them. And, and so in our pathway, we had a median value of four. And in the standard of care, they're getting 20 pills. So these are same procedures, same type of patients getting nearly five times as many pills and consuming uh, quite a lot more there. As you can see, we have zero pills consumed, where it is uh, five in the standard of care group. And then we compared outcomes and they have very, very similar scores. They were satisfied, there was no red, it was pretty high quality of life. So this was a great way to show, to use this data in, in these uh, groups we had and, and to show that, that uh, our pathway worked for patients. And then one of the things that I, I really appreciated about this too was um, our uh, opioid sparing group. This is the number of patients receiving no prescription. Uh, as you can see in our opioid sparing group, 114 patients elected to uh, not receive a prescription compared to zero in the standard of care. And we don't really have the data to describe why, but my guess is it's, it's these facilitated conversations when surgeons are talking to patients about their pain before surgery and setting expectations is uh, many times you will hear anecdotally, I'm sure Dr. Inglesby, you've had patients who say, I, I don't want opioids, I've heard enough about them, I've had surgery before. Um, and so this is kind of that opportunity to not receive opioids at all uh, and really keeps them out of the medicine cabinet altogether. And, and so uh, this is a really great thing that our pathway did. It, it opened that conversation and uh, provided patients a chance to not even receive opioids. Um, so uh, one thing I do have to share, we, we did have financial incentives helping us get this into other hospitals. Uh, it's kind of an unfortunate reality of healthcare, money, money moves care. Um, and so Dr. Endlesby spent a lot of time thinking about uh, a strategy to incentivize surgeons and, and we use that um, to get them interested in uh, engaging with these practices. And I, I think it's uh, you know, an important conversation to have what in anything you're trying to do in, in healthcare, there has to be some kind of money to accompany the narrative or uh, cost savings uh, as well. And, and so uh, we use that a lot to, to incentivize surgeons and get interest in this. Uh, and so this is one study we published at Michigan Medicine. Uh, over here, this was kind of the, the level of success we achieved with uh, just kind of spreading word of mouth. This was before the incentive took off. Uh, and so this is measuring our attestation rate, and this is kind of the percent of all surgeries that uh, a surgeon said 
this this pathway was followed in our in this surgery. So 40% of our surgeries were following this pathway in August uh, when the incentive went live, and, and you can see that was up to 60% uh, quite quickly. That is uh, very fast for healthcare. Um, so we were we were very uh, excited by that, and that was as we were taking it with the state. And then our friends at the uh, urology data collaborative, they also uh, wrote a paper to describe how um, the physician groups worked with healthcare uh, insurance providers in our state and collaborated to devise this kind of scheme and uh, reduce opioid prescribing. Um, so that's something as, as process engineers, we have to keep in mind that money moves care and we need to think about incentive structures that can help that. Um, let's see, if make sure we have time here, okay. Um, so the uh, working with other hospitals was certainly a uh, challenge. Um, and I, I thought it would be helpful to just kind of describe some of the challenges we uh, encountered in our, our uh, experiences here and um, hope that you know, it's something that can be insightful to you guys. Um, but so we, this is our pathway for our very modest uh, little center here at, at uh, Michigan Medicine. It was very humbling for me uh, when we stepped out of Michigan Medicine, uh, we went to a place uh, called Hurley Hospital, which is in Flint, Michigan. Um, and, you know, I came in with my little pathway document ready to change the world. And, and we go into Hurley Medical Center and like, there's like a gunshot wound in the lobby when I arrived. I was like, oh my gosh, um, it, was, it was crazy. It was just a different, different patient population and, and they are contending with um, things that, you know, we are lucky to not really see as much here in Michigan Medicine. And so this was a humbling experience for me. Um, it, it kind of showed me that patients arrive to the operating room with a lot more problems than is just their surgical pathology. Um, and there are things like transportation and nutrition and social support that go a long way for uh, creating good outcomes and ensuring that patients don't consume a lot of opioids after surgery even. And, and so that was just a, a really humbling realization for me. I appreciate that it, there are a lot of challenges in healthcare as systems engineers, we need to really think about you know, all of the inputs, not just kind of the, the surgical pathway. Uh, another challenge we, we encountered um, was our, our resident surgeons. So they're kind of the ones who get left to do the prescribing, at least at Michigan Medicine and a lot of other places as well. And uh, as we kept tacking on procedures with these you know, very specific prescribing recommendations, a lot of them were saying, I can't keep all these straight. Like I just did a, a lap coli this morning and two hernia repairs and then you know, fix something else in the afternoon. And, and I had to prescribe different opioids for each one of those procedures. Uh, and as we attach financial reimbursement to this, those quantities became really important. It was actually how the insurance company measured the pathway was followed. And so it was really important they prescribed that amount. So we had to figure out kind of a solution because uh, just hoping that they would remember 17 different procedures was not working out. And so we created this in our electronic medical software. Uh, this is an order set. So instead of remembering, you know, how many opioids do I prescribe for 17 procedures, they just need to remember one order. And that takes them to this page where acetaminophen and ibuprofen, that's Tylenol and Motrin, are automatically prescribed to the patient. And it's uh, prescribed as a no print. So what this does is puts that right on their medication orders, right on the front. You'll see these two, it, it emphasizes Tylenol and Motrin. But then for the clinician, they can just click the procedure that they perform and it will automatically prescribe the requisite number of opioids. Uh, and this was, I wish I had the data to show here, but they, the uptake in the correct prescribing amount skyrocketed after this. Um, and it really goes to show that like we as engineers can make the best choice, the easiest choice. Like that is, you know, one of the most simple and beautiful things we can do. If everybody wanted to prescribe the correct number, it was just kind of difficult for them. Um, and, and so this, this order set here really cemented that, let it, made it easy on them, and uh, we had a lot of success there. Uh, another one uh, challenge we had, there was a lot of um, concern about patient safety. Uh, this, this pathway kind of relies heavily on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is like uh, ibuprofen and, and Toradol. Um, and patients with chronic kidney disease can't take a lot of medications like those, and, and patients with liver disease have trouble taking acetaminophen. Um, and, and so 
our, our clinicians were kind of expressing concern that if, if patients that come through this pathway and you've pretty much automated the prescribing part of this and it's just going to deliver meds to these patients, they were a little concerned um, that there could be some injuries or you know, some, some uh, bad patient events uh, as a result of that. And so we worked with our colleagues in the IT department to develop basically a system in, uh, in our electronic medical record system, which is called a best practice alert. And what that does is it scans the patient's chart uh, and will identify diagnoses of uh, chronic kidney disease or liver failure. And then it will see when a clinician goes to prescribe them a specific medication, it will warn the clinician and say, this patient has chronic kidney disease. Are you sure you want to prescribe this med? Uh, and I, I don't, again, have the data for that, but I, I know uh, we have missed some uh, pretty significant patient events just by using uh, that best practice alert. It is more the clinicians um, and, and our uh, colleagues thank us a lot for doing that. So we're ensuring patient safety. And then our, our last challenge is, is kind of this guy, uh, that, that surgeon that doesn't think he's the problem, kind of denies the narrative, uh, doesn't get his vaccination in time <laughs> or prove it. Uh, I found that this guy is, is kind of a myth. Uh, and that, uh, you know, there are people for whom emails and uh, meetings and announcements and things just don't work. They require a little bit of a personalized touch. Uh, but, uh, you know, looking at the data, it looks like it's this, these stubborn kind of holdout surgeons. Um, and, and so it was, it was humbling for me to recognize when we worked with these surgeons and, and kind of sat down with them and showed them their data uh, and, and expressed the narrative to them and took a little more personalized approach most all of them changed their practices or, or modified them. Uh, and so that, that was kind of a, a, a challenge, but it made me realize like uh, every clinician means to do well and uh, they, they kind of you know, structure their life around helping others. And, and you just have to help them see that, that they are indeed helping or hurting others with their, their behaviors and, and it works pretty well. Um, so uh, that kind of speaks to this uh, solution, which Dr. Eaglesby very uh, eloquently uh, shared with us. You, you have to use data, narrative, and systems. Um, and I, I will just reiterate that the data and the narrative kind of work together uh, but the system is, is really important. It's structuring financial incentives, uh, structuring the prescribing or you know, whatever activity it, is, activity it is, structuring it so it's the easiest thing to do um, and so that people know they're doing the right thing is, is uh, a way to change care. Um, so I'll leave you with these two slides. Uh, this is kind of a, a look at how we did across the state. Uh, so we, this is a, a graph detailing uh, opioid consumption. Uh, through the period of 2017 to 2019. Um, that's that black line there. And you can see as consumption fell, uh, the patient's pain, which is this blue line here, did not change whatsoever. And their satisfaction with surgery did not change as well. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of that, that slide. It shows we, we really uh, made a big dent in, in what patients are consuming after surgery and, and did so in a safe and effective manner. And then the other one, compares how Michigan is doing with uh, other states. And that's uh, these lines here. I, I believe it was all of our neighboring states plus Kentucky, right? And that's, um, that's that black line there. So they, that kind of shows the secular trend. Uh, opioid prescribing was declining, uh, but with our efforts here in Michigan with the uh, quality collaboratives that we're fortunate to have and, and all these financial incentives, uh, we were able to really reduce opioid prescribing. Um, so thank you very much for listening to our talk, and uh, I will be happy to take any questions. So I'll step in and collect cards. Um, where'd you go? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so I have one actually. Um, I, I I love the talk in part because I love the work that you're doing and, and the importance of it, but I also love how it shows all of the complexity and the value of, of this systems-based thinking. And so one of the things I'd like to hear a little bit more about, you talked about the education piece. And if you go in and say to a patient, this is what you should expect, and this is what's reasonable, and, and this is how we're going to manage it, and so on, that that you have patients who are making choices about their their trade-off of, of the risk of opioids versus pain management and so on. It seems like you also have to deal with a lot of other agents in this. So a nurse who's concerned that 
better for everybody if you're sleeping, which opioids help with. A parent who can't tolerate seeing their child in pain. A surgical resident who doesn't have the training to really manage pain and doesn't want the 3 a.m. phone call. The, you know, what, what were some of your experiences with trying to deal with this multitude of all of the different incentives that people have, mm -hmm. both for and against using opioids versus alternatives? Yeah. That's that's really great. One of the things we we did a lot of was was sharing the narrative. I, I think that was really powerful when, when you kind of show some of the data and, and describe why it's important that we kind of uh, shift away from using opioids as the primary mode of pain management. Um, there are certainly those kind of attitudes that persist, but I, I think it's again kind of another boon for systems engineering when when that nurse who might have you know, some opinions about opioids and, and sleep and things like that. She, she has to follow the order set that's on the screen, right? And, and um, you know, to, to do otherwise is to kind of step out of this, the stream of care. And, and so um, I wanna say we made it harder for them to do that. But I, again, I think we made the, the right choice, the easiest choice. And, and um, you know, when, when they start seeing those effects on the floor, it, it doesn't happen overnight. You start with your, your kind of, uh, Horses out in front and, and the mules follow. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Anglesby, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I think uh, the system has to facilitate clinical decision making and nuance, and every patient is different. So, you can design a system and it's kind of for the 90% solution, and you just have to have enough flexibility. There's 10% of patients who need different types of care, and you just have to listen to them. And, uh, yeah, um, kind of going off of that, you're talking about the systemization of the decision of what to prescribe and how that was just built into, um, you know, the electronic medical system being able to do that. Did you find or see that um, preoperative education of patients followed with that as well, or were, were other measures taken to systematize that education piece of it? That's a great question. Yeah, we, we systematized that as well. <laughs> that was, uh, so this this was kind of a we didn't know if we could do it until the people in IT told us it was possible. But uh, one of the things we did so if a patient was participating in this pathway, uh, the first thing that would indicate that is the surgeon when they're ordering the surgery, basically saying I, I need you to schedule this patient. It creates an event in our system. Um, and so when they did that, they would also click this box that says this patient's participating in our pain pathway. Uh, and when they did that, that would fires the delivery of our patient education. So it's patients on this pathway, automatically uh, the education when our patient sees us in um, the pre-op clinic, that education gets inserted in there. So nobody has to think about it. The surgeon ordered it, it goes in there, and then when the nurse goes to review the, the patient's discharge paperwork, education's right in there. So it's, it's again, kind of making that simple, making it automatic. Um, you know, only one person needs to decide they're participating in the pathway and then everybody does the care that follows. And so making that as easy as possible was uh, definitely a boon to getting it done. I'll add one little thing, because um, you should probably stand over there because of the Zoom. Um, you know, the other little trick is uh, patients are scared, families are scared, and um, super powerful to share with them Kind of what normal is so i'm taking out your gallbladder the average patient at the university of michigan now doesn't take any opioids but we're going to give you four just in case so this is the expectation setting so that there's probably some like psychological kind of like framework around it but just setting the expectation the average patient takes this number of pills and then like that um and then we we kind of engineered that into our education kind of systems. So and it, it changed. The like numbers came down, the numbers changed. So. so I'm curious when you um, follow up with patients and you ask them, you know, what, how are your pain levels? Are you taking any painkillers? What kind of painkillers are you taking? Are there separate questions in terms of what is your pain level without medication and then after you've taken whatever meds you're taking where it ended up being is there separation between sort of what's your pain level without the meds and then how well are the drugs working for you 
I can try this. Um, so what questions to ask the patients? Um, we've definitely relied on one of our colleagues, Chad Brummett, who kind of, and Jen Walji, the, the two of them think about that all the time because the, you know, start, the questions matter a lot. I don't think we did it. If we were doing real science here, we would have been very you know, structured with time and the specific questions. We did this across the state, so um, it was more, it was definitely quality improvement, so we took what we could get. Um, so to answer your question, we didn't. Um, one thing we did do, though, is reinforce the fact that surgery hurts. You know, it's like it's going to hurt. Um, and that's a normal kind of expectation. And once you kind of, I think I'll let people appreciate that, then um, then I don't know, just kind of changes their mindset around the pain. I don't know if I answered your question very well, but we had like one shot that follow up, one phone call, because we, you know, there's literally hundreds of thousands of people that kind of eventually went through the pathway. So we didn't do super good science. Good science would have been randomized, 300 patients, 150 each group, you know, call them every day. We weren't able to pull that off. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um have a question, maybe just just miss this part. I'm just wondering if that this framework can be extended to other procedures or other setting, for example, in the primary care setting, which is probably one of the most common entry point to opiate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the most common entry points for opioids actually are the emergency department, dental offices, and surgical care. Um, it's reasonably uncommon for primary care providers to start people de novo on long-term opioids. It used to be more common, but that practice has largely gone away. So our targets have kind of been the emergency department, which they actually changed their practices before we did in surgery or dental care, because I think they were more, they saw the epidemic more than, or they're the first person to see, see all the problems going on, right? So, um, so, uh, I think realistically for people who are opioid naive, most people, the data is they get it from a procedure, break your leg, have your gallbladder removed, have a baby, um, or dental care. And dental care, we've, we've worked a lot in dental care. That's a harder, we, we, we haven't been as successful in, among the dentists for various reasons, probably system reasons. A lot of them are independent practitioners. They don't work in a system, so you can't have people like Alex design a system that really affects all of them. So it's harder to do. Good question. Yeah, thank you. I'm also a little bit curious how this decrease in the prescription side affect the likelihood of becoming a long-term opioid users. Yeah, so did we actually fix a problem? It's a great question. Our most, I can't say I can tell you for sure. It's definitely, there are fewer opioids in the community for people to get hold of, and that's not a bad thing. Whether people come in and, you know, that 6% number of people who keep taping opioids, have we reduced that number? Our data seems to show numbers now around 2%. Um, and there are, the, the thought there is that there are some people who, when they are exposed to opioids, really struggle to stop taking them. But that is not good science because that is like um, different data sets and stuff like that, because we never really were set up to do good science on this. We're mostly set up to kind of change practice. Um, so anecdotally, um, I would say yes, but um, that is not in New England Journal of Medicine because we don't have that kind of data. So good question. Thank you. Do you remember your question? Uh, no, I have several questions. Okay, so the, the one that I had seen on your card was how did you actually figure out what numbers to use for which procedure? Where did that decision come from that uh, cholecystectomy is different than a mediastinoscopy? Yes, that, that would be the massive data set we were fortunate to have from our CQIs, those uh, collaborative quality initiatives. So we, we had a trove of data showing surgeries that happened in the past, you know, for the last 10 years or whatever it is, and in a wide variety of procedures, and we would take those and then you would find kind of the 75th to 85th percentile, right, Dr. Inglesby, and, and determine that that's how the 75th, 85th percentile of consumption is about as many as we should prescribe, and that leaves a little bit of room for uh, refills and things like that. But we have noticed once you reduce those prescriptions, the amount patients consume actually falls as well. 
And so that kind of highlights the importance of that iterative cycle of continuing to measure after you've set a prescribing guideline, how has consumption changed and then revising that guideline continuously. So do you think that you're going to continue to decrease the amount prescribed like more so like over the years now? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think, Dr. Eggleston? Um, probably, probably continue to um, go down slightly, but to be honest, we're kind of turned our attention to other problems. So we've kind of I think, fixed the easy stuff. Now we're focusing on people's substance use disorder, chronic opioid use. They're more complex and we're working on their best pain care for them. Um, I still think opioids are an important part of care. Just have to be, you know, used with caution. So to answer your question, um, if I was taking out your gallbladder, I would probably aspire to do it without any opioids. But I would have a conversation with you, you know, first. Um, and there, you know, the system is it's always going to have to have some flexibility in it. So, good question. Hi, Donnie. How you doing? Um, I guess the one question I had was, I know in the U.S. that our patients do have some sort of proof in terms of the medication. For example, they could come in and say, they I want this, and sometimes the doctors do succumb. So how is that kind of taken into consideration? Or is it that hmm. I guess I'm a doctor, you are, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're right. Um, certainly there's more patient advocacy, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, I think it's pretty powerful as a physician to kind of see data where you basically think you're doing harm. And clearly no one wants to do harm, nor do patients want harm done to them. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's just, a, it's a conversation with the patient. Um, I don't want to discount the important patient voice or the somewhat concerning voice of marketing of drugs, all of which is a big part of all this. And that's probably part of the reason why we got ourselves in this pickle in the first place. But the bottom line is doctors wrote scripts. Doctors have to own that, that is their job. And so that's, yeah, good question. Yeah. Shared decision-making is a big part of pain management and opioid prescribing. And I haven't heard too many anecdotes about you know patients specifying the type or or quantity. Maybe the type more often. There are some patients who who know you know oxycodone didn't agree with me in my last surgery. Could you give me something else? Uh, I think that's uh, you know accommodated pretty frequently. But I, I don't know if we've ever had a patient demand a, a higher quantity than their doctor is willing to give. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think it like, happen. Like if you're trying to engineer a solution, you got to go with the tide. So the success wasn't just us, right? This is like CNN had articles on this. Like everyone knew about the open up. We were right place, right time. Dr. Cohen is like designed, you know, COVID vaccine. Like everyone's on board, right? So it's hard to do, but if no one wants to do it, it's really, really, really hard to do. Like right now, I think health equity is a big space in healthcare where if you want to try to design, engineer things, then it's somewhat more of a, the politics and the momentum are moving in that direction. So you kind of have to be attentive to, I don't know what the right word is, but the way the wind is blowing, if you want to kind of, if you're going to try to engineer solutions, you got to just kind of take advantage of, of a positive moment. So, and we were in the right place at the right time. So, Mike, I, I want to, uh, I'm going to indulge you one last question. I know we're running a little long. I want the students to have lots of time for discussion, but one of the things that I frequently talk about when as an engineer, when I go into a healthcare environment, um, I frequently hear people getting very concerned about each patient is unique and you know they're not widgets and you can't treat everybody the same and, and so on. And, and the argument that I frequently make is that my goal is not to treat everyone the same. My goal is to take the people who are all the same, the, the situations are all the same and streamline them so that your focus can go on the exceptions. And the analogy I frequently make is, is um, you know, banking. That there was a point in time where you would go to the bank for any financial transaction, and then it became you could do almost everything in an ATM and just do the complicated stuff with a bank person. Um, or booking a flight. You now, you don't go to a travel agent for a flight, you book it on a website. And one of the things I'm wondering with the pain issue is, 
you've got a whole bunch of people where I'm going to be just fine with Tylenol after this particular procedure. A handful of people who are going to take one or two of their, their uh, prescribed opioids. There are people for whom pain will be significant, and we see sort of this pendulum. Of there was a period where pain, you know, surgery hurts, and so you live with it. And then we started moving in the direction of, no, we should be finding ways to deal with pain. And now we're kind of swinging back. I'm curious, though, are surgeons the right people with the right training to be handling those exceptions, or should part of what we're doing be finding the the, the, is the process of what to do when things go wrong. And that's part of my concern here is when you start to have people whose experience is horrifically painful, that's, I think, what's happening with dentistry, right? I went to, to Dr. Inglesby and I was miserable after my wisdom teeth. I went to Dr. Zhang and I was fine. I'm just wondering if part of our approach needs to be not just not over prescribing people who don't need it, but the, the short question and that long unnecessary that what are we doing for people for whom there really is substantial pain and, and where do you see opportunities there that we might take advantage of for that 5%? Yeah, I, I usually use the 10% number, but yeah. Uh, I just like, think it's, it's trite, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, like don't, don't create a pathway for the 10%. It's kind of what we did here. And it, Hurt the other ninety percent. Yep. Um, I don't know. To be honest with you, I, I actually never really thought of it that way. Is like, all right, we could engineer a system for the majority so that we had more time to really focus our energies on the quote at risk group, right? I never really thought of it that way. Um, I don't know. I I can't say we're doing anything. Can't say like, yeah. The easy answer is like, if someone has complex pain needs, they need specialized care. Those human beings don't exist. We have you know, more liver transplant surgeons than a Dixon psychiatrist yep, at the University yep. of Michigan. You know, so, um, I don't know. I think, uh, I think it's a good question that I'm going to have to, I don't have a good answer. Surgeons aren't like engineers. We, we, once we somewhat fix a problem, we're all on to the next problem, right? So, Richard knows. So, um, I don't know. Well, you're not trained at that. The, the reason I ask is I'm just sort of interested in the mindset of, the skills to perform surgery are not necessarily the same skills to manage someone whose pain is not being managed. Oh, yeah, and totally. Whether, whether the pathway should be moving you into a, a different space altogether is, is something I'm curious. And it sounds like there's not a lot of that. I think there's problems we, happening right now. Yeah, I mean, this is more of a clinical thing than engineering thing, but I think there's a deeper appreciation for the complexity of pain. And some surgeons are better at, like, Orthopedic surgeons, spine surgeons, they deal with pain all the time, so they have more training in it. Like, I'm a transplant surgeon, I don't know anything about pain. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're good questions. I think um, they're definitely good questions. I will say, like, the reason I, the, the whole framework around stories, I think your doctor partner is just your story partner. The doctors can tell stories that people can kind of care about, and that can get people to the table. And I think you need data people and then you need engineers to design these systems. And that's like the projects I've been part of kind of have all of the above. And they aren't necessarily, you know, the people, you know, they it's not credentials. It's like, what's your skill set? Are you a process minded? And you know, we have lots of process minded people on this thing that really made it kind of go. So. Absolutely. I know we couldn't, I was waiting for you. <laughs> you can't go home until Richard has a question. And I'll have more questions. Um, you find it ironic that the surgical community is sort of at this point, uh, 10 years ago, it's sort of the, the, this far detached from concern about addiction, given that William Halstead was an addict. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of like the first surgeon to set up like surgical training. Actually, many of the early surgeons were famous heroin and cocaine addicts. Yeah. I mean, I think my answer to, to that is, you non-surgeons just don't understand how hard it is being us. No.